Welcome to the second part of a mixed orbs and rods study conducted at uh, Karangini National Park uh, in collaboration with Dr. Brian Tyson from the United States Department of Defense and myself, owner of Energyscapes. Uh, this builds on the previous presentation, part one, which went into a lot of detail on anomalous orbs and rods that we found at the park and described their characteristics, uh, their shape, their motion, and what we thought was going on at the park during the first field trip. So the background behind that it remains the same. Uh, it's at Karajini National Park in the Pilbara, Western Australia. An outback desert climate with hills, canyons, gorges, red rock, dirt and bush. And we're still continuing with the same hypothesis as last time, that a phenomenon can appear anywhere at any time, then it must transit the non-visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum because we cannot observe it. So we continue with that hypothesis and we've now done it two or completed two more field trips recently and put part two of the presentation together there's one more presentation to go when we go back in the field for a fourth field trip and just confirm our sampling protocols but that that'll happen much later for now i'd like to go into the results of the second and third field trip and i put this presentation in together uh, with some feedback from dr brian tyson on its contents and what we thought would be Best in terms of summarising the observations we've made that build on the previous one. So the contents of this presentation are as follows. We have the background which remained the same as last time, which was what are the research questions, the methods, the sam sampling system, and the, the sorry, the sampling and the systems that we used, and a brief look at the frame capture analysis from last time as well. In other words, the different types of orbs and rods, rods and their characteristics, and some variation on form or further variation on form that we found this time as well. And then the key results from the latest field trips, we look at uh, counts by sight and time, counts by cardinal direction. We've got footage on rod movement. We've also got some interesting results from electric and magnetic field intensity anomalies and an associated interdimensional anomaly. We look at the difference between ghosting and phase shifting and we've got some footage on that too. And on the recent field trips, we also discovered that there were objects, unaccounted for or un unconventional objects in the night sky. So we take a look at those as well. And I have some footage of that to um, talk about. Then we move into interpretation and we look at how we might interpret the electromagnetic field anomalies at the site. Uh, the potential for portals and wormholes that this may be associated with what the energy source is. Uh, we look at ley lines and what we think might be going on with ley lines and the concentration of energy around the planet in terms of potential portals and wormholes and the manifestation of objects related to it. After that, we discuss what's next. So further field work, um, data analytics, more on signature, signature analysis, and the potential to deploy a technology to interact with this ecosystem level phenomena. And then we talk about investment and funding. So without any further ado, let's get into it. So the research questions, uh, they remain the same as last time. So we had, what are they? Where do they come from? What are they doing? And what does their presence mean? What does their activity mean? And what areas are they present in? So that hasn't changed. Uh, we've got more detail on their appearance, why we can see them and then not see them. Are they cloaked? Could they be cloaked? Why is or how is extreme velocity achieved? How is inertia overcome? And what is the energy field around them? So we build on that in this presentation from the, the latest two field trips. The methodology stayed the same. We've just refined it more in terms of sampling protocols. So I won't go through the whole thing, but the sensor systems are there. Uh, we set them in cardinal directions. We take baseline readings and pre preliminary observations confirm the presence of the phenomenon. And then we record it in IR using those sensors and other associated systems, including electric and magnetic field intensity. 
and we build a picture um, using computer screens and visual capture and look at video footage and extract the data and summarize it from that footage and then we reposition the sensors and do it all again so we build up replicates by time and by site so systems utilized remain the same we still need funding to get, get some more of these systems underway currently we're using our optical and infrared along with uh, electromagnetic in terms of electric and magnetic field intensity and measurement and of course signature analysis and uh, we want to build on that in the future by getting some more software or more powerful software capable of doing some more types of analysis uh, including numerical modeling and data analytics uh, but that will come later and we'll discuss that towards the end of the presentation so sampling in the field trips so in the second and third field trip what we did was we sampled our sites a number of sites a few hundred meters apart and at each site we would take IR foot, footage for one minute in each cardinal direction and at the same time we'd take electric and magnetic field readings so we did nine sites in total two to four hundred meters apart along a walking track and then what we did on the third field trip was at one site overnight we got up three times so we got up at 8 p.m midnight and 4 a.m for an hour and we took IR footage every 10 minutes in each cardinal direction so we ended up with six replicates over the hour in total of um, each cardinal direction and we took electro mag electromagnetic readings at the same time this uh, frame analysis this is from last time it's just to remind the audience about the types of objects we're seeing and, and their categorization so initially they were the orbs were put into three categories so we had the large white uh, orbs that had a, um, a um, precession about them or a wobble we had small and medium type gray speckled orbs and then we had some skipping or smaller white orbs that appeared to um, skip or arc skip in terms of rods from last time it's the same we had larger white rods with a spiral, a lateral spiral around them which we think is related to how they move and overcome inertia we had a smaller more grayish version of that as well and then we had the smallest one which appeared to have an inability to orientate itself in the direction of movement um, which we caught on film as well and then we categorized them from last time as well so I won't go through the table again it's in presentation one but we just summarized the key characteristics behaviors uh, and shape of these orbs and rods this time around we did have some form variations come up having a lot more uh, archive video footage to look at we had some quite short larger ones uh, with still with a spiral around the rod and then for other rods we had larger ones but again they had an ex it was extended and thicker the spiral spiral was still going around it but it appeared to be uh, undulating a, a little bit differently and then we, this time around we had some quite significantly larger and thinner rods they looked like there were a few meters or more in length and then the spiral around them was considerably longer and, and a lot more undulations we also found with the uh, orbs that there was a very very small one which we think is different to the medium sized gray one and these ones appeared quite a lot and they'd often go in and out of the ground as well or appear near the ground seem to be sort of inquisitive and, and, or investigating and the other thing we found with this smaller white arc skipping orb um, is that when it's still because we've got some footage of a one that manifesting right in front of the camera it was actually spherical in shape and this cone that was around it that you can see here was actually 90 degrees apart around a sphere so we think that this may be just be the distended shape of this type of orb we'll look at the key results now and, and work through the ones that I mentioned at the start in the contents so these are counts from site two 
So you can see this was across nine sites and you've got the average number of large and small orbs and rods here, which didn't appear to change in terms of cardinal direction from east, north, south and west. Uh, if you look at the total counts, you can see you've got considerably more here of these type than you do large and uh, large rods and large orbs and small um, ones in comparison. So there was approximately four rods for every one orb observed this time around. If we look at, at counts over time from trip three, you can see here we've got 8 p.m. to midnight and 4 a.m. There was a significant um, difference in terms of the total counts of orbs and rods between 8 p.m. and 4 a.m. in the morning. So if you look at the total counts here, you can see the obvious trend or drop off in total counts. By the time we got up at 4 a.m., the, the activity or movement or motion and numbers of orbs and rods had dropped off considerably. And this has a lot to do, we think, with the intensity of what we consider a portal or um, um, anomaly that surrounded the whole event and seemed to die off in the early hours of the morning. And we did capture some footage of this, which I'll show you in due course. We did counts by replicate, which we can see here. And we've got for the second and the third field trip in each cardinal direction. You can see there's no real difference in orientation when we look at each cardinal direction for total counts of orbs and rods in either the first or the either the second or the third field trip what you can notice so that is that we had a lot more or a higher number of orbs and rods in the second field trip compared to the third field trip out in the field What was interesting here is we also looked at the direction of movement of rods in the second and third field trip. And what this represents here is, for example, if you're facing north, this is the, rod, the number of rods moving east and west. And then if you're facing east, it's the number of rods moving north and south and so on around um, the cardinal directions. So in the second field trip, you can see relative to the observer, most rods were, when facing north, were moving east and west, or facing east were moving north and south. Now, if you go to the third field trip, the total number is reduced, and you can see that relative to the observer, uh, we're more central to the, the direction of orbs of, I'm sorry, rods. For example, if I'm facing west, we've got more moving north and south. But we still have numbers moving in all cardinal directions, which is a little bit different to the second field trip. So relative to the observer, it seemed to be a lot more centralised to the movement of rods in either direction when you're facing cardinally north, south, east or west. This has implications later on for um, what we perceive or think is a, a portal that is around or centralized centralized around all this manifestation of orbs and rods and other uncon unconventional objects that we observed at the time what we did was we look at the percentage distribution here uh, you can see if we take rods in trip two for example when we looked uh northeast and northwest you can see there was a higher uh, percentage or proportion of rods that were moving in that direction if you look at field trip three though you can see that that changed um, what it suggests is that there's no um, preferred direction of movement of rods when facing in a cardinal direction. It seems to change. And um, that might be relative to any slight movement or variation in the uh, manifestation of the portal that we think is associated with this or an inter interdimensional anomal anomaly, which we'll talk about um, very shortly. I've got here some video, uh, video footage. Uh, it's at half speed of rods moving through the sampling site. Now the first video shows a coordinated spatial orientation between two rods that pass through the field of view. The second one shows, shows uh, synchronous movement of three rods moving through the field of view. Now we didn't observe any acceleration um, but we did observe object avoidance, suggesting there's some awareness of their environment in terms of movement and orientation through it or coordination between them. So let's have a look at the first um, selection of video footage.
So you can see from that first video footage, one rod was following the other and appeared to be uh, able to distinguish objects in the way moving through the field of view. If you look at the second one now, and we'll just pause and take a look. So you can see from that from we had three rods move through simultaneously the, the, the field of view and appeared to, we assume or I think that there is some level of coordination to be able to move through in that sort of symmetry across. You'll notice uh, afterwards that one other rod appeared moving across in the opposite direction. So there appears to be some sort of coordination between rod movement that you don't necessarily see uh, between orbs. And we still think there's a strong association between orbs and rods. Uh, why that is at the moment, we're still not quite sure. So we'll move on from that. Now we move to electromagnetic field intensity. So in the second field trip, we recorded magnetic and electric field intensity during the day, and then then compared that to night. Now this proved quite interesting. So Electric field intensity during the day built up to about 26 volt meters, and then at night in this across the same sites, so we had seven, eight, nine sites where we recorded this and took an average. At night that reduced to about 15 or just over 15 volt meters. Now if you look at uh, the magnetic field intensity, there's a similar um, relationship going on there between day and night. So there's a Build up during the day, we had 2.25 microteslas there in terms of magnetic field intensity, and that dropped off overnight, uh, which was similar to what happened to uh, electric field intensity. So we came up with a possible theory I'll discuss later on on why we think we've got this unusual anomalous electric and magnetic field intensity above background levels that you just don't see in, for example, a park away from um, high voltage power lines in suburban areas. Now next is the interdimensional anomaly. So during the whole second and third field trip, we managed to capture on film uh, what we'd call in infrared, this haze moving through from a general east to west direction uh, in the sky, all in the sky and moving through all, all around us. And at the time, both times, it was a perfectly still night. There was no wind. There was no uh, sort of humidity or convection currents that might cause this because it was moving through at quite a high velocity. You'll see it in the video footage. It's kind of a haze that moves through almost like a mist. But again, there was no, there was no temperature inversion. There was no um, fog either at the time when we recorded this. So it was very unusual. And when you look at the footage, you'll see that within it, you can see what I call ghosting orbs, and then another set of footage where we've got the manifestation of orbs in our physical dimension, coming from this interdimensional anomaly. And then we talk about interpreting this in terms of electric and magnetic field strength and what we think the relationship is that's going on there for our further investigation. So let's have a look at it. We've got ghosting on one hand and phase shifting on the other. So if you look at this video very carefully in the clip, you'll see just within this um, magnetic, electromagnetic or interdimensional anomaly moving through, you will see very faintly there, quite clearly, there are orbs in it, and I call them ghosting. So you'll notice in the section of video I pointed at, quite clearly there are orbs that haven't come through or manifested moving through that haze that was all around us at the time. Just happens the camera out of the angle. We found when we filmed an infrared uh, in the right direction, we could get quite a good um, footage or film of whatever this haze was that was moving through that had all these orbs ghosting through it. Now if you look at the second footage, you'll see um, not only ghosting, but the manifestation of orbs quite clearly in our, in our dimension.
So you see there that there was ghosting occurring, and then we've got these orbs that manifest clearly in our physical dimension. Now that was happening all the time, all around us when we were filming uh, and, and counting uh, orbs and rods from footage that we'd collected and analyzed. So there's a difference here. We've got ghosting versus phase shifting in and out of our physical dimension um, within this interdimensional anomaly. Now what we discovered in analyzing all this archive video footage, because we've got quite an extensive amount of footage now to work with, was that there were flashes of unconventional objects in the night sky around us and more than one and in more than one cardinal direction now i only just started notice, noticing this or taking notice of it when i was analyzing footage so in our next field trip we're going to be more cognizant of what's going on in the night sky around us but the best one i got was the one you're going to see now and i've got a frame analysis in the next slide so let's have a look and then i'll talk more about it So you'll notice in the night sky there was a flash here, a bright, a dull flash, and then an orb flash of, of, of a spherical shape. And you'll notice all through that you can quite clearly see what we think is this interdimensional anomaly or haze from it moving through, and you'll see objects ghosting through it. So in the background we started noticing this unusual flash in the night sky, and on the next slide I have a breakdown of that. So here it is here. So the bright flash looked like this when we did frame analysis. Then we had the dull flash. And most importantly, we had this luminous flash or spherical flash. It showed up this shape, which has significant symmetry and what looks like indentations all around it, creating this pockmarked pattern, almost like a beehive. And we think that that's a spherical shape. We're not sure what the object could be yet. It is unconventional, okay, there's no ailerons, there's no wings, there's no tail, there's no jet stream, there's no noise. And it very, very slowly crawled across the night sky. And in the previous footage, where it stopped there, um, it actually reappeared again over on the left-hand side of the video later on uh, for a while, and then stopped again and disappeared. So around us in the night sky, I started noticing in video footage these flashes going on but I didn't have a very good frame analysis of the other one so our intention when we go back in the field is to capture this in a lot more detail in cardinal directions because whatever these unconventional objects are they seem associated with the interdimensional inter anomaly and the manifestation of orbs and rods so we think this whole ecosystem event may be under intelligent control uh, we're still gathering evidence from that but it's starting to look like this might be the case. We'll now move to interpretation of our latest results from Field Trip 2 and Field Trip 3. We'll look at, um, mostly at the electric and magnetic field anomaly because we gathered quite a lot of information from that. So if, for example, we take the electric field intensity, the differential between day and night was at 11.08 voltmeters. Now, if you consider that the background electric field in a home environment can be up to 20 voltmeters, depending on uh, appliances that are operating. Under power lines, that can be 10,000 voltmeters. The floor of a train is 300 voltmeters. So what we think in the presence of this phenomenon is that it's like standing in a house with all these background appliances running or going at the same time. Now consider the magnetic field intensity, so the differential between day and night was 0.92 microteslas. Now if you look at being in a house away from high voltage power lines, background levels are up to 0.2 microteslas, so we're well above that. If you're directly beneath high voltage power lines, however, there can be up to 3 microteslas at ground level. So look, we're a lot closer to that out in the, at, at the field site. And then uh, 50 to 100 metres away from high voltage power lines, you're at background levels. So what we think is that in the presence of the phenomenon, it suggests that it's like standing beneath uh, high voltage power lines in terms of ma magnetic field intensity. Okay, so there's a bit of difference going on there. 
Um, we think that's related to the manifestation of orbs and rods, utilization of energy or uptake of energy and energy sourcing from this interdimensional anomaly. And we'll talk about why now. What we've looked at is the capacitor induction model and its application in understanding portals. So we know that the uh, differential for voltmeters was 11.08 voltmeters between night and day. So the model we're looking at is that there's a buildup of electric field and uh, potential energy during the day. Okay, so that's your um, capacitor. Uh, reaching a maximum electric field intensity opens the portal in four dimensional electric space, thus your electric field. So once open, this portal uh, releases that stored energy until it dissipates and then it's not enough for the interdimensional anomaly to stay open so it closes. And if you looked at the activity of orbs and rods overnight, by the time we got to 4am in the morning, it slowed down a lot less a lot less movement and in, in video footage that haze had slowed down and almost disappeared and there weren't many orbs and rods and then there was a few ghosting through it very slowly if you look at the magnetic field intensity differential 0.92 microteslas between day and night so the corresponding build up of magnetic field intensity occurred during the day now the magnetic field intensity uh, the maximum was observed as the portal opened, which corresponds to the maximum electric field intensity. So once open, it decreased. We think it decreases as the source of kinetic energy, uh, um, which is the electric field decreases overnight, okay, to try and keep it open. So obviously, the amount of energy available for utilization by the portal, the orbs and the rods dissipates. By the time you get to the morning, there isn't enough to keep it open anymore and essentially it's got to recharge. Then we consider, well, what's the source of energy for all that to happen? Where's it coming from? So if you look at the capacitor inductor series circuit, we've got a decrease in electric field intensity and an increase in magnetic field intensity. So that's your capacitor, your potential energy converted to your kinetic energy. Um, so electric potential decreases from the capacitor, so that's emptying the tank, and then your kinetic energy increases. So that, that's more available energy for the increased spin of an object. So where is the object's ability to source energy from in terms of motion and spin? and overcoming inertia, maybe it is coming from the available energy built up to open this portal and make it available for manifestation in our dimension. So you get theoretically the same type of behavior observed in a wormhole, a portal or interdimensional anomaly. So the input side, which is the electric field, acts like a capacitor in 4D scale of space. You build up enough energy density so you have an increase in electric field charge, opens the portal, you get release of that as magnetic energy and available kinetic energy, and then that becomes a source of energy for these orbs and rods to overcome inertia, have extreme speed and no acceleration, and manifest in our dimension. That's the theory we're working with at the moment at the site. So what is going on, in summary? The available kinetic energy possibly provides a power source for orbs and rods to operate in our dimension. That available energy dissipates through the night with a corresponding decrease in the activity of orbs and rods. We observe a decrease in motion of orbs and rods and their ability to orientate to our physical space over time. The decrease in numbers of orbs and rods manifesting in our dimension over time is also observed. Then, as uh, Brian, Dr. Brian Tyson pointed out, why don't we look at the proximity of ley lines, of course, because that theoretically concentrates energy around Earth or any other body for that matter in terms of linking magnetic field lines and the buildup of charge or electric field intensity from the spin of an object, which of course in this case is a planet. So we think these ley lines may concentrate electric energy buildup and provide a conduit linking Earth's magnetic field lines to uh, the opening of a portal uh, in terms of 4D scalar space through um, an electric field. So the portal opens and objects manifest and carry out the objective. Now the point being at the moment is we do not know what the objective of this whole event is. 
either the orbs or robs, rods or the unconventional object. So other objects in the night sky may be associated with monitoring the activity of the objects in the portal, but what is the purpose? What are they doing? Why are they here? And we also notice that there is a synchronous movement between orbs and rods, and we have observed object avoidance. Here we just used Google Earth and uh, uploaded a ley line program to it. Now here's the location of our site in Karajini National Park. And then over here you've got an intersection of various ley lines. Now we've got one being the Great Circle octahedron vertices, okay, and rhombic lines from a Thai contrahedron. So this location of these vertices is not far or intersection is not far from the, from our field site and what we're quite interested to know is can we develop a model that predicts that the location or manifestation of this anomaly uh, in relation to ley line vertices and then can we use that to start identifying other sites uh, around the planet where we know this is going to happen and then deploy there uh, do baseline surveys and then see whether that intersects with um, say other important sites to us in terms of defence facilities, government facilities, um, are the objects that are interested in uh, nature or natural phenomena, or are these objects anomalous objects associated with some sort of agenda or purpose uh, with being at any particular site. So that's, but that again, that's related to a business plan that I've put together in consultation with Dr. Brian Tyson of Department of Defence, which she has a draft of at the moment. So moving on, so what we've got here, orientation to surround, so we're nearly there, just bear with me. So location-centric evidence from results suggest activity is radial and centred around a portal. Observer orientation is offset, depending on proximity to the centre or origin of that portal. All orbs are observed to phase shift into physical space from this portal. Orbs are observed ghosting within the portal and manifesting it into our dimension. And the entire ecosystem event seems coordinated and likely under intelligent control. We've also looking at communication. So obviously there must be some sort of communication of this synchrony of a mo motion and orientation. That suggests that there must be some sort of communication between all these objects. Uh, rods are often observed moving around in small groups and we have extensive footage that demonstrates this. Orbs seem to be more by themselves. There is does there seems to be some association association between orbs and rods when they pass through or manifest, but as yet we can't establish a positive link there. We're we're making that assumption. Uh, objects in the night sky seem to surround the location of the interventional anomaly, and when we're back in the field, we're going to look a lot more at whether we can corroborate or confirm this. And there's a standard flash sequence associated with these objects in the night sky. So when we are filming, we can identify by the flash sequence that that is the same uh, unconventional object or objects. We've seen this in the presentation before, in presentation uh, one, looking at energy source mapping, natural, man-made and multi-domain looking at whether these orbs and rods are sentient uh, in terms of a life form or extension of it or an energy collector, non-sentient in an underlying ecosystem component just in infrared or a new organism that's part of the plant or animal, animal uh, kingdom. Whether they're man-made or uh, non-human, we are not sure of yet, but however, they are they autonomous if they are man-made? Are they carrying out surveillance? Are they sampling or collecting? Are they controlled? And if they are multi-domain or non-human, are they being controlled by a non-human intelligence? How is that related to the objects in the night sky we saw? If so, are they autonomous? So are they sent by another non-human intelligence? And when they manifest, are their signatures collected, connected to larger objects? So is there an association there in that interdimensional anomaly with those unconventional objects that we observed? 
So what's next in terms of study moving out into field trip four coming up soon? In trip four, we want to just bed down and confirm our sampling protocols. So night one, we want to do time sensitive sampling at 8 p.m. midnight and 4 a.m. Exactly how we did it before. One minute in each cardinal direction. Uh, six replicates uh, for each of those hours overnight and also record electric magnetic field intensity. And then on the second night, we want to go back along the walking track and confirm across multiple sites between 8 and 10 p.m. sampling in each cardinal direction for one minute, doing the electric magnetic field intensity, and then we just move to the next site and repeat it. And again, being more cognizant of these unconventional objects in the night sky. Our data analytics. So moving forward, we want to look more at hardware and software uh, with a lot more computing power so we can start looking at multi-dimensional scaling analysis and integration with GIS software and spatial orientation and uh, with the view to building a numerical model using data analytics and clustering factor analysis, multiple logistic regression components or principal components analysis that's where we're heading uh, we're going to need funding for that but in saying that what we have now is an extensive database or archive of analyzed video footage that at least provides a baseline confirming the presence of all this phenomena and its ecosystem and the objects associated with it Signature analysis. Now, I haven't dealt and in, delved into that much in this presentation. I've left it out because I need a lot more thought to go into it and a lot more analysis needs to be done. What I have done is I've just extracted the signature from the um, second field trip and just put it next to the first one here. Now, I have to yet find out in the first analysis, I managed to convert the signal to a music to a musical scale and in this current one uh, i haven't been able to do that yet so i still got to get to that but one is derived from the other so if i just play the first one first now <laughs> Now that was the underlying signature that came through the infrared camera when we were recording video footage. Now the background in, uh, on the IR in RAW, because that slowed down, but the RAW speed just sounded like background noise. But when you slow it down, there is some sort of signature there. In the, in the first field trip, I'm, I'm not sure how I did it yet. I've got to go back and have a look. But I converted that to a musical scale, which sounded like this. Now, if you listen carefully, you can see that one seems to represent the other. So we've got an undulating signature here in terms of frequency broken down into the musical scale that sounds like what you just heard. Now, I have to talk more with Dr. Brian Tyson about our approach to signature analysis and, and, and also computing power and how we're going to go about that in more detail and look at whether that's associated with um, communication, uh, and navigation and coordination of the whole event. So obviously something's going on there. We're not quite sure what it is. At the moment, we've just confirmed that there is a signature associated with the whole event. As to what that means, that is yet to be determined. Technology. Now, I've thought about this quite a lot and done a lot of background reading on technology application because we'd like to be able to study orbs and rods and access them, access them in a lot more detail. And we've been looking at phased array technology and frequency analysis and refining a concept for developing a phased array we can deploy in the presence of this interdimensional object that has a pitch at the signature range identified, which is 0 to uh, 1500 hertz. 
and then another one at 1500 to about 24,000 hertz. So most of it's below human hearing, apart from the high end of the second uh, uh, frequency range in the signature. Uh, obviously, it's got to be programmable and able to mimic object signature patterning. Now, we think based on a lot of the theory around phased arrays and sound carrying matter, that if we deploy such an array in the presence of the anomaly, that we can stop, hold, uh, and confine potentially some of these orbs and rods within that array for further study. Uh, during the uh, manifestation of them when they utilize the available energy coming from this whole uh, capacitor inductor model that we talk about with portals. So we, we think that, that, that the potential for this technology is quite significant in terms of being able to access these objects. Uh, again, that's intellectual property and part of a business plan in terms of developing a patentable technology that goes with deploying to site and deploying sensors and sensor arrays to record the whole event. So a way ahead from here is the proposal for continued research and funding for equipment to get out on the field. We've got a project proposal prepared in that regard for funding. We also have a draft business plan now, which Dr. Brian Tyson has a hold of that looks at, well, the next few years um, supporting further research part-time uh, during having a full-time job, which is teaching, but getting some funding to push ahead with this. And in the background, looking at industry investment in, in a company and its business in terms of lab facilities, office amenity, lay-down areas, and centralization of monitoring for clients through... Um, you know, cent cent centralized feeds, whether you collect that data and download it in the field or whether it's automated and sent to a satellite and back to a monitoring facility. So there's a business plan that's been developed around all that as well. So that leaves it where we are at the moment. We have a draft business plan, which Dr. Brian Tyson has at Department of Defense. We have a project proposal and then the original statement of intent about the future direction of the company. So thank you very much for listening and once again I thank Dr Brian Tyson for all his assistance in facilitating this project and its development over what's uh, the last year or so now and we're at a stage now where we're just going to bed down our sampling in the field on the next field trip and from then on in it's working with our archived data and liaising with potential funders and investors moving forward to carry on the project. So thank you very much for listening and I will be in touch in the future through Dr. Brian Tyson and Department of Defence about how we move forward.